We are continuing to follow the latest developments here out of the Middle East. A live look over at the Israel-Gaza border. Dozens of people reportedly dead after Israeli airstrikes targeting Hezbollah in Syria's city of Aleppo, right near the city's international airport. Reuters reporting at least five members of the Hezbollah terror group have been killed, and in all, 38 deaths reported there, but information is still fairly limited. I do want to talk about that and all of the latest developments here, so let's bring in Alex Trayman, the CEO and Jerusalem Bureau Chief at the Jewish News Syndicate. Thank you so much, as always, for taking the time to be with us here on Live Now. Thanks so much, Josh. Good to be here. All right, so at this point, we do know some limited information. Dozens of people dead in these Israeli airstrikes. What sort of information do we have overall, and what is kind of still left to figure out? Well, Israel's continued to strike uh, inside Syria. Iran uses Syria as a land bridge to bring uh, weaponry and rockets over to uh, Hezbollah in southern Lebanon. And uh, Israel's been striking repeatedly uh, at sites that have been used. Uh, we we're told that uh, this site in Aleppo, that there was a meeting that took place between members of the IRGC, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, together with Hezbollah, and that there's also a weapons storage site there, which includes uh, anti-tank guided missiles and drones. Uh, and so this is just one of the latest uh, strikes that uh, Israel has been participating in really for years uh, in order to prevent weaponry from moving into southern Lebanon. And this area has been kind of struck before, correct? My understanding is that the airports in that area have been hit to kind of prevent weapons from getting distributed, right? Yes, Israel struck at the main airport in Syria multiple times, destroying the runway. It keeps getting uh, repaved and, and rehit again. Uh, yes, Israel's been operating, as I said, for years uh, inside Syria to prevent weapons from moving into southern Lebanon. Uh, you know, Iran has a, a very serious stronghold inside Syria, which has been hurt by the, the civil war. You have a, a situation there where, where you don't have control. So Iran has filled some of that vacuum and Israel operates against it uh, whenever it has intelligence that it can take out weapons or uh, high-ranking members of the IRGC or Hezbollah. We did hear from Israel's president who did say Biden is a, quote, great friend of Israel. We know there's been some kind of back and forth, some disagreements between Biden and Netanyahu overall on the war itself. So is that surprising to hear that comment from Israel's president? Well, I think that the president uh, is doing his job, which is to try to make some some damage control here and uh, to show that there is still a uh, good faith and that Israelis do still recognize that the uh, United States is its most important ally, uh, and particularly in this war, uh, and that uh, Israel still relies on the United States for a veto at the United Nations, which it signaled that maybe it's no longer willing to use, and, and Israel would like to get that veto back, uh, and that Israel still is relying on weapons from the United States. So uh, I think Herzog, the president, is just trying to do a little bit of damage control and try to simmer some of the tensions that have been brewing between the administration and Netanyahu. And while we've seen that growing divide there between Biden and Netanyahu, I did want to talk to you about Texas Governor Greg Abbott. He actually uh, did speak about an emergency order that he was issuing that would curb anti-Semitism at colleges and universities in the U.S. So despite the differences between Biden, Netanyahu, the U.S. and Israel, it sounds like the relationship between the two is still fairly close. Well, certainly, you know, the overwhelming majority of Americans support the state of Israel and support Israel against Hamas, uh, you know, in this war. But the issue of anti-Semitism on college campuses has been brewing for, for 25 years uh, and has really nothing to do with Israel's war against Hamas. And, you know, you can disagree with the policies that the state of Israel takes, and particularly in this war, but you still should support the idea that Jewish students uh, – who may or may not support the war uh, between Israel and Hamas, that they should have a safe space to operate on college campus. We've seen a dramatic rise in anti-Semitism in the United States, both soft and violent forms of anti-Semitism, and the amount of uh, incitement uh, and intimidation on the college campuses has reached intolerable levels. So you have issues of, of Israeli policy and also issues of anti-Semitism. American Jews should not be subjected to anti-Semitism on a college campus, regardless of what Israel's doing uh, in the Middle East. 
And we're approaching six months since the October 7th attack. We are getting very close, only about, I would say, maybe a little more than a week away at this point. Did you think when that attack happened and the war broke out that this would be where the situation stood six months later? Well, Netanyahu said from the first minute before Israel launched its ground incursion that this was going to take months. Uh, and uh, you, the Israel's had no choice but to go from top to bottom in the Gaza Strip. You know, they're finding uh, rockets and, and uh, RPGs and inside almost every house. I mean, from what I understand, close to 90 percent of the buildings that the IDF has gone into, they found weapons. They've also found tunnel shafts, which go onto the entire strip. So they have to they have no choice but to go house to house to house in Gaza. And uh, the fact that it's taken months, I don't think it's a surprise. Uh, there's no way to know from the outset how long such an operation is going to take. In addition to that, the United States has certainly been slowing Israel down uh, by forcing them to uh, create humanitarian corridors and, and move people from place to place, uh, enforcing that Israel will act in a, in a very precision guided fashion and now also slowing up the, the entry of the IDF into Rafah in the south. Uh, it's making the war take longer. Let's talk a little bit more about that Rafa operation. We've been hearing about it now for weeks upon weeks. Do you think that we are any closer to seeing that actually happen? Because it sounds like despite what the U.S. has said, Netanyahu, others there in Israel still plan to go forward with that Rafa offensive. Absolutely. Netanyahu delivered a strong message to Anthony Blinken last week uh, that despite U.S. wishes that uh, they avoid such an operation, that the IDF is absolutely going to go into Rafah. That said, uh, they need to set up um, a facility or a safe area where the civilians that are holed up in Rafah now, basically living in a, in a in large intensity, will have some place to move. So they're they're creating that space and they're also setting up the infrastructure to make that work, which includes uh, the provision of additional tents and to make sure that there's a uh, access you know for humanitarian aid to come in israel is actually uh, spending a lot of money together with qatar in order to set up such an arrangement but it's going to take time then they have to move the civilian population which could be close to a million people from where they are in rafa several miles north to where this uh this new area could be and only after that would you see the idf go inside rafa so netanyahu has said that uh, it's likely to happen in april or may uh, but as far as netanyahu and the war cabinet are concerned uh, this is an operation that is going to happen what about the latest on the attacks there by hezbollah obviously off the top here we talked about the situation with the airstrikes against hezbollah over in syria but what is the latest on the situation between israel and hezbollah over there on the northern border well, what we're seeing now is that uh, Hezbollah has been increasing its attacks uh, on Israel, uh, both in terms of quantity, but also even in the last week in terms of putting much heavier warheads on the uh, rockets that it's sending inside Israel. So previously sending mortars that, you know, they definitely do damage, they can kill people, but Hezbollah now, uh, you know, of flexing its muscles a little bit more and showing that they are uh, are ready to escalate, although it's a test. You know, both sides are continue to escalate, escalate slowly. And at this point, you don't know what it's going to take uh, in order for a full-scale war to break out. It could happen any time. We do know that uh, Israel's trying to uh, respond to Hezbollah aggressions um, in a powerful way, but doesn't want to see a full-fledged aggression right now. They don't want to fight two fronts at the same time. If they're going to fight in southern Lebanon, which most Israelis think will happen at some point, uh, Israel wants to make sure that it can divert their soldiers and their tanks uh, to that uh, to that front. And at the same time, Israel's also rapidly trying to advance some of its missile defense. Israel's been working on a laser version of the Iron Dome, which means that uh, Israel would be able to shoot out more Hezbollah rockets uh, in real time using a laser that doesn't need to be uh, replenished the way the Iron Dome and the Patriot systems need to be replenished manually. So Israel has many reasons why it wants to postpone full-fledged conflict. At the same time, Israel's not going to allow uh, this conflict to, to end until it is sure that it can return tens of thousands of residents to their homes uh, who have been evacuated in the north.
And before I let you go, I do want to see if you can provide some clarity on a story that's been circulating a lot here. Can you explain the Israeli Supreme Court's order that essentially prohibits the government from providing stipends to the ultra-Orthodox Jewish men who do not serve in the Israel Defense Forces. What is the background there on all of this? Because we've seen a lot of discussion over it. Can you kind of break it down for us? Well, it's it's a long and complicated story that goes back to the beginning of the state, and I won't get into all the details, but uh, essentially um, you have a uh, ultra-Orthodox members of the society that uh, learn in yeshivas full-time, that they study Torah as a profession, uh, and they believe that uh, this provides actually some degree of defense for a Jewish state, uh, but you have the, the rest of the country which says uh, that uh, also that these Orthodox Jewish men should take their fair share of the burden of uh, serving in the military or some other form of national service. Some do, uh, but there's been resistance uh, from many of the leaders in, in the Orthodox communities to these ultra-Orthodox communities to, to have their members serve. Uh, the Supreme Court has now ruled, and in the past, the Supreme Court, by the way, has overturned plans that have uh, pushed towards some degree of integration, uh, but in the midst of the war uh, with with a previous arrangement now expiring, uh, the Supreme Court has ruled that uh, stipends for students that are, are no longer exempt uh, from serving in the military should be cut off. Uh, and it's it's a big cultural and social issue in the state of Israel. Many Israelis want to see these ultra-Orthodox serve. There are many more ultra-Orthodox that want to serve in the military. The question is, you know, how do you how do you move a whole portion of the society that that is avoided service into the army? Uh, you know, how do you create the frameworks to allow them to enter in a way that's comfortable for them? Uh, and and how do you do that uh, while you're still fighting a war? When when there is the need for more soldiers, when the government should be dealing with the war, they're now also being forced to deal with this very complex uh, and, and long debated social issue. All right, Alex Trayman, thank you so much as always for taking the time to join us and help break down some of the latest developments there out of the Middle East. As always, we appreciate it. Anything else you wanna add about anything before I let you go? Well, you know, it's uh, it's complicated. You mentioned that the war is dragging on for six months. There's definitely political tensions in, in Israel. Uh, I think that the government, under the circumstances, is doing a fantastic job of uh, advancing the war in, in an efficient uh, manner, in a careful manner, and also dealing with tremendous pressures that I think the government never realized that it would be under, including, you know, immense pressure from the United States and the international community, as well as some of these domestic tensions all brewing at the same time. It, it's quite it's quite astonishing that they're able somehow to, to balance all of these tensions simultaneously while fighting a war. Alex, as always, thank you so much for being here with us. We appreciate it. Thanks so much, Josh. All right, everybody, I do want to take you back out to this live image that we do have. Again, very limited information on uh, the situation here, but dozens of people reportedly dead after Israeli airstrikes that targeted Hezbollah, the terror group there, in Syria's city of Aleppo, right near the city's international airport. Reuters reporting at least five members of the Hezbollah terror group have been killed, and in all 38 deaths reported, that number could rise. And as we get more information, we will make sure to bring that to you right here on Live Now from Fox. The time now is 6.34 over on the East Coast, and it is 3.34 on the West Coast. My name is Josh Breslow, and I'm here to bring you all of your top stories and live events across the country and across the world.